Hello, everyone. So, Monica just summarized my first four slides. Um, <laughs> so, yes, that's my name. Um, yeah, so as Monica mentioned, I just moved to Berlin four weeks ago. So, hello, everybody. I'm new. I, have, I need friends. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't really, but maybe. Um, and I'm working for, for a company called Pitch, who you probably haven't heard of because we don't have any products yet, but hopefully you will hear about us in the near-ish future. So um, basically we're trying to make a presentation tool that people love instead of merely tolerate because it seems no one really loves PowerPoint or Keynote or maybe Keynote has a little bit of like friends uh, in Google Slides. So uh, we think the world deserves quite a bit better than what we've got. Um, so keep, keep your eyes and ears out. Hopefully we'll have something. I am actually presenting in an alpha version of our tool. So I really hope it doesn't crash because I don't think anyone's actually presented yet. <laughs> um, if anything goes wrong, I have a backup uh, PDF, but let's see, um, but hopefully. So uh, yeah, mandatory, I have to say, yes, we have three positions open, uh, senior community manager, senior content strategist, senior product manager. So if you or your friends fall into those categories, uh, come talk to me afterwards. It's a rare chance to talk to or to join a really well-funded startup, um, <laughs> which is important, and uh, with a very senior experience team with a track record of success. So. Uh, Yes, as Monica mentioned, we work together at Frog. It's a design consultancy based globally, but um, we were based in Munich. And so I've worked on quite a few different projects in the connected spaces. So I've worked on connected coffee machines. That's a great idea, right? Uh, I've worked on connected devices in the in rear seat entertainment kind of space in cars. Um, and I worked quite a bit um, with IKEA, helping them launch their first smart home product, which was a smart lighting product called IKEA Trod Free, something like that. And I'll be talking mostly about that, but also some generalizations about um, what I learned throughout um, these various different projects. And naturally, some of these projects or products also received reviews. They received reviews like this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they all also received reviews like this. <laughs> I mean, I actually consider that kind of a success. Like, that's like, <laughs> like you know, uh, in the smart home space, that's actually not too bad. Um, and I take partial blame. Some of the product projects, I was just involved a little bit at the edge, coming in a bit later, some a bit more. Um, you know, there was good reviews as well, but they're not so funny. So, um, yeah, we can talk about that later. So, yeah, so I'm going to talk about four main things today. I'm going to talk about uh, why smart home isn't quite mainstream, which I think complements very much uh, what Thomas just talked about. But um, luckily, thank thankfully, I'm coming at it from a slightly different angle, so you don't get the same talk repeated twice. I'm going to talk about what we tried to do differently. Uh, and then what's particularly interesting is what makes it hard to design for. So why is actually, there's, there's some reasons some smart home products are bad, and I want to talk a little bit about that. And then lastly, what it will actually take to become mainstream. So let's start with the first one. So I think we already uh, kind of got from our show of hands that smart home is a mainstream, because if this audience doesn't have uh, smart home products, this, this audience is already kind of here. Um, and so I think smart home in many cases is here, actually. It hasn't even got to the sort of the, the people in this room. Um, and there's this famous concept of crossing the chasm, which is getting kind of from here to here is uh, very difficult. But I think also from here to here is quite difficult as well. Um, and all the research we, we did on various projects kind of proved, us, proved this to be true. The exception is, as you mentioned earlier, is things like smart speakers, things that are very, um, you know, very single use case, Bluetooth speakers as well, but they're not really integrated into your home. I think they're sort of a home accessory. There's a difference when it's something that's part of the furniture, that's your lighting or your door lock. That's to me is the, the really hard space. And so there's two reasons. I, I think we have a slightly different angle, I would say. Uh, I think marketing is important. Um, for sure, but I think there's two before that. There's actually maybe two other problems. Um, one is that in many cases, um, smart home isn't solving real problems, and it, and if it and then it's also not delivering on the promise 
Uh, and the first point is demonstrated by this diagram. <laughs> and this is kind of the reality that we have, actually. Uh, you know, and I think you touched upon on this. I think people are talking about features. Um, how does that actually integrate in people's lives? Um, and I think, so I, I think like they need to be marketed, but we also actually need to improve the, the, the value proposition as well. Um, what's interesting about this is if you think about smart locks in particular, and some of the innovation that's happening, um, you see there's two interesting use cases that I find uh, sort of more surprising and interesting. One is that Airbnb hosts are starting to embrace smart locks. And that's because that, that if you draw the diagram for that, it's much, it's much bigger value in that situation. Um, so the value is quite high. And the other, the other thing is, uh, you know, Amazon is trying to do this home delivery where you have the doorbell and the lock, and it means that you'll deliver your packages. Um, and that's creating new value over um, what we currently have. So that's what we really need to look for to find the success. And my, my perfect example of a really, really bad product that's solving a problem that no one really has is this. It's called Smalt, and it was an Indiegogo campaign. It's the world's first interactive centipe centerpiece and smart salt dispenser. Ooh. Uh, thankfully, I'm incredibly happy that this did not get funded. <laughs> because I, if it had, I would have really been worried about the world uh, or myself. Um, what, what's amazing about this is that it's, 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 they put a lot of work into it, you know? Like, that was the terrifying thing, you know? <laughs> like, they made models, they'd, they had a prototype, they were really advanced, and at no point had they asked, like, who wants this? Why do they want it? It, it has a speaker, a Bluetooth speaker, and a light, and a salt dispenser. And, and so, like, it's wrong on many levels. Like, um, the lighting is okay, I guess, um, but why do you want a speaker in the middle of your dinner table? Like, you're talking to your friends. Like, sound is fundamentally, we prefer to be ambient, right? You don't want the sound coming from here. It interrupts your dinner party. Lighting is maybe okay, as long as it's not a disco. Um, yeah, and then uh, the thing that just really kills me, it's not even a salt grinder. It's literally a dispenser, which means, <laughs> like, it's just a storage. It's just salt storage. So, yeah. Right. Okay, so next one is not delivering on, its, on the promise. So this is when you actually, you say you can do something, but you actually can't, or you don't do very well. Um, like this, this is Nest. So, you know, but you want to turn up your uh, temperature or turn it down? No, sorry, your thermostat is restarting. Back in a bit. You see a lot of things like this. Or this is from a Wi-Fi connected juicer. And it says, the, or they call it a press, I guess, in the US. Uh, the press needs to be connected to Wi-Fi to make juice. That, that, that's not okay, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't even understand how this happened. Like, I understand that maybe you don't get some added features without Wi-Fi, but that the product fundamentally stops working because of Wi-Fi. I even saw a car recently. Uh, like, a car was going to an update, and you couldn't use the car while it was having a firmware update. Like, how crazy is that? And the thing about this is, is that we've actually been here before. You said that like smart home is like 30 years old, and I think that's really absolutely true. And it's like, but we haven't learned from our mistakes of the past. Um, I think designers and technologists, we always look to the future. We're like, what's next? What's cool? But you know, sometimes we should look a little bit more back in the past. So I hope the sound's working. Let's take a little hist. Let's go for a little history lesson, okay? Honey, turn off the light. Has this ever happened to you? Presenting The Clapper. Let your appliances turn on and off just by clapping. Clap on the music. It's easy. Just plug the clapper into any household outlet. Then plug in your lamp, TV, or stereo. Clap on. Clap off. For places hard to reach, the clapper makes it easy. Plus, the clapper comes with an extra feature to make your home more secure. Turn to the away function, and your lights turn on at the first sound it hears. Minutes later, they turn off, and the clapper resets to help protect your home. Leave your appliances plugged into the clapper, and your lights will go on, turning away unwanted guests. Clap on, clap off, the clapper. You know, th this product still exists. Look, this is a website, you know. This <laughs> um, 
And the, the product exists, and the product is also on Amazon. So I went to look at the reviews. Can you guys see this? <laughs> if you've got bad eyesight, it says, I wish I could go back in time and kick myself in the head for buying these. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and so what's uh, it's really interesting is that like, the product doesn't deliver on its promise. It, the actual advertisement, there's value there. You know, there's actually real value when you might want to re remotely control your lights without getting up. You know, the elderly woman, that's a scenario. If you maybe have some disability, it could make sense, right? But it doesn't work. <laughs> it just doesn't work. It kind of works. So um, if doors set it off, dogs barking set it off, random noises on the street set it off. So the problem is your, your lights or your stereo, they are coming on and off. So it just doesn't work that well. It kind of works. Um, and so there is a few good reviews, and often the good reviews are from, like, yeah, someone's like, I got this from my, you know, my mo elderly mother, and like, actually like in the video, and she didn't mind if there was a problem, you know, because the value was quite high to actually, you know, if it, does, if it, if it goes off a few times, that's kind of okay. Or maybe they live in a quiet street, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it just doesn't deliver on its promise. And also it lies in the video, which is really shocking to me. So they clap and the stereo comes on. But th that type of stereo, I'm pretty sure by law, when it comes on from having power off, it, um, it goes into standby mode by default. So you're going to clap, it's going to turn on, but there's not going to be music. So, and there's a lot of that type of stuff in the smart home space where it's, it's just like, it's kind of true, but it's not really true. So, and I think I, I really love this quote from Claire Rowland, who has an amazing book um, called, Des I think it's Designing for Connected Devices. And she says, we don't expect internet-like glitches from the real world. And I think this sums up the big problem, which is that we, we just don't expect our light bulbs or our door locks to not work sometimes. They need to be pretty solid. You know, you need to be able to get into your house. Um, and so, yeah. So that's the kind of wh why I don't think it's mainstream. And I want to talk about what we tried to do differently. And I think this touches on your question that came up earlier and some of the questions. So we can see at least we tried to address some of them with some success. So I'm mostly going to talk about this product by IKEA. I spent two years working on this, so I can talk for a long time about it. <laughs> I think. The main starting point, though, or the, the fundamental thing where we had tried to approach differently, which I think is also, again, related to some of the questions, is that we were working with IKEA. They're not a technology company. They're a home company. So rather than work, if I was working with a tech company, we were approaching it from the home up rather than from the technology down. They had a fundamentally different perspective than many other clients who are more, that I've worked with that are more in the tech sector. And IKEA knows tons about the home like they really they in, do an incredible amount of research and they have a very good like kind of just feeling for what's important and they have like yeah you can they have so many databases about what size apartments people have and how they like to live and everything so and this can be summed up with one very strong statement that we started with which was that we said that our competition is not other smart lighting products our competition was the normal light bulb and this changes the conversation quite a bit. Um, because, I mean, first of all, because smart lighting products were not mainstream, why, why do we want to compete with other products that are not mainstream? Um, IKEA isn't, doesn't do anything for niche. You know, IKEA is like, we're in it to win it or not at all. Um, and the other thing is that IKEA is the world's largest seller of light bulbs. <laughs> so they're kind of like, we need to nail this because otherwise we lose our light bulb market. But when you ask this question, it gives you very interesting answers to your question. So when you ask this question about a smart lighting product, and you're like, does it need a login? The answer is no. It doesn't need a login. Why does a smart light need a login? So for, so for this, this product, it doesn't have a username or a password, which is unheard of in the smart lighting space. And we basically, because we were asking this question constantly and comparing it to a light bulb, we went through a list, I remember being on one conference call where we went through a list of 10 questions and, we, and people, these were all the things that we wanted. And we said, what of these 10 things do you really, truly need a login for? And there was only one. The other nine could be 
could be achieved with, through a different mechanism. And so because, and, you know, because IKEA has this mentality, um, we would just say, okay, well, then let's not have a login, which is just mind-blowing. There's no way you can tell like, Philips to do that. Like, that's just not going to happen. Um, and it's in the home. It's in a shared environment. So why should it have a login? Whose login does it have? Like, you have multiple people in the house. And so I think that was quite a kind of, that was the way we answered a lot of questions. And that only came because our client had this very strong thing at the start. And also, if you don't have a login, of course, you can't lo lose the data. Mm. The next point on that is like, a typical light is like this. You know, you get up, you switch on the light, the light goes on. A smart light, typical smart lights, you find your phone, you unlock the phone, you maybe get distracted by some notification, uh, then you find the app, then you open the app, then you turn the light, and then the light goes on. <laughs> Unless the light switch is actually off, and then the smart light has no power to it, in which case you have to get up and turn on the light. So this is one of those situations. It's just not actually better. So the first thing that we did, and the very first product that we released with IKEA was this, which is a light bulb and a remote control. That's all it does. It doesn't do much, to your point. It changes color temperature. So it doesn't change, the first version doesn't change color. There's no pink or blues or greens. It's just cold, warm, and warmer. And this allows you to adapt your lighting. It basically, and the question here is, how do we make lighting better for people? That was the question IKEA would come back to us with. How do we make lighting better for people? Not what is a smart light. So this is actually an incredibly smart light. There's loads of technology in it, but it just doesn't do that much. And it can't even connect to the internet alone. Uh, you can't connect your phone to it. So basically what we did was we took what was out there in the market and we sort of said, let's extract a little bit of value and make a sort of non-smart product or smart-ish product. Maybe it's smart-ish home, I don't know. But the way I like to think about it is smart home without the smartphone because the smartphone itself is not a particularly good interface for that. It doesn't add value. When you, when you look back at that list, the, smart the smartphone is the problem here, not the smart home itself. But of course, we also did a smart home with the smartphone, <laughs> uh, because of, you have to do that. So then you have the gateway, and then the remote control, or this, you have the remote control as well, and you have the app, and it does all of this stuff. So then it does other things, like you get advanced control, you get uh, moods that can be more adaptive, um, you have timers, so things like, you know, pretending you're at home when you're on vacation, uh, setting, you know, the lights to slowly come up to wake you up in the morning. These types of things that actually start to add, I think, real value. So. But the important thing we did, even with that version of the product, um, is that we, had a, we still had this remote control at the center. So the remote control will be used for basic everyday use for the whole household, could be used by anybody. And then the smartphone, is, or the smartphone and the app is only used for sort of configuration and advanced control, maybe for enthusiasts, maybe it's only used weekly. So the interesting thing is we spent like days and weeks on like designing an app that hopefully no one actually uses, <laughs> uh, which is a very strange thing to do. Um, but that's, that sort of division, at least, was interesting at the time. Like, other products have now started to copy this trend, and I think it makes sense, because like, you don't want to reach for your smartphone to do basic tasks. And that comes down from a lot of the research we did, which is, was about designing for the whole family. A lot of the smart lighting that we did when we went out into the field, um, you know, it was a very standard situation. It was such a stereotype. There was like a geeky guy. He would bought some smart lights. And then if he, if he lived on his own, it was fine. But if he had a, you know, if he had a partner of any kind who, or he had visitors, suddenly it was like someone was like, hey, can you turn on the lights? Uh, oh, can you turn off the lights? And a lot of and there were people that even, they had smart lights and then their partner had said, you got to get rid of this because it's useless. Like they liked the feature, but they didn't like that it was on, it lived on people's phones. It's, it's not a very shared experience. But you know, you have guests who come over, you have a babysitter, you have your family who come over. Like you can't have a situation where your lights just don't work because someone doesn't have the app. And yet that's what many of these first generation products did. It's, it's kind of mind-blowing, really. So designing for the whole family was one of our fundamental principles. Um, and so what's interesting is like this product, which started like this, is that now, and back to this theme of smart home with a smartphone, is that now you have voice that's coming into the mix. And I think voice is pretty interesting, because now you can just say, you know, uh, 
okay, Google, um, turn on my lights. Um, and it starts to compare to this. You don't have to get up anymore. Um, so voice is kind of changing this in, um, equation a little bit. I think maybe even smartwatches potentially, though they're still quite nerdy. But I think the interface has been a big problem with smart home, um, which has been this smartphone. And also we tried to make things very human and relatable. So you mentioned before people don't understand the value and they didn't understand the value because this was the type of thing you would see. This is actually Philips Hue. I think they've changed it now. But this was like for quite a few years, this was their color picker. But like, who needs this, this particular green? First of all, no one even likes green. It makes you look not gray. Like, it's, it's not a great color. Um, and so what we did instead is we have like 16 colors and we hired a professional like lighting expert to pick those colors based on their expertise. And it's based on, like, there is, two, there is one green and this is kind of a yellow. The picture is not so great. But it's based on real natural colors that you see in the sky, um, which is much, much better. And so maybe 16 isn't the right number, but this is definitely not the right answer. Um, and this is something that we did throughout the app. You know, we didn't, we, we called the feature vacation mode. Um, I think to your point is like, we tried to sort of show the value. It wasn't called timers. It, it, we actually had one feature called timers um, and one feature called vacation mode. And there was always this discussion like, well, aren't people would be like, aren't these the same thing? And we'd be like, they are actually the same thing. Yes. <laughs> but they're framed differently to help people understand the value and maybe in the future they grow to be technically different as well. Um, and lastly, in this section is, if you're able, use a cable. This is maybe a strange rule, but this little device, this is the gateway or the hub, they're, they all have different names and this is what allows like the lights, the lights talk to this and this talks to Wi-Fi. Um, but you just plug it into your router just like that. And that's basically because it takes, I think the whole setup took about five to seven minutes. If you try to set up Wi-Fi, it would take 15 minutes. So most people will plug this thing in beside their router. So we optimize for the 95% of people who will probably just go rather than optimizing for the small amount of people who want to set up via Wi-Fi. Um, and the first version of it didn't even, you couldn't even do it via Wi-Fi, I think. I think we didn't release it in the end. And really, this was, yeah, just again, it was like sort of home up instead of technology down. It was a very fundamentally different approach. Uh, the third thing is what makes it hard to design for. So just want to give you a little brief glimpse into some of the weird things with connected devices. So the first thing is uh, the technology we're using is fundamentally different than what we're used to. Um, and this was a very steep learning curve for me, I won't lie. Um, um, and it's basically this, it's like, so a typical technology that we're often, many of us designing for is like fast CPU, lots of memory, it's always on, it's always connected, it's very responsive. Um, even things like smartwatches kind of fall into this category. Um, quite a lot of anything that's plugged into power falls into this category. But the typical IoT technology is like slow CPU, little memory, um, it's running on a battery maybe, which means it's sometimes connected and it's very, it's not responsive at all. And basically once you have something that's running on a battery, it's like waking up maybe twice a day to, it wakes up from being in a sleep mode. It wakes up, it checks if it's got new messages and it goes to sleep again. So when something's waking up twice a day, how do you send it a software update? Or how do you tell it it needs to control a different set of lights now? It causes very odd things and it makes it much, much more, you can't just copy something that you're used to from the internet. Um, and also there's another layer of complexity. So this is often what we have. We have an app or a website and it connects to a database and then there's a little bit more complexity to it. Um, but essentially it's very like send, receive, bum, 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 bum. And there's a lot of other complexity, don't get me wrong, but from a architecture point of view. This is kind of what a typical smart lighting solution w works. They're act these are often running on what's called, uh, what do you call it, mesh networks. So they all talk to each other. So if you, if you wanna, tell the remote control, hey, remote control, you need to control this light instead of this light. You send it to the gateway. The gateway will send it to one of the lights. You don't know which one. It might even send it from this one to this one. And then it will try send it to this one. But this one's actually asleep because it's saving battery. And maybe it's going to wake up at some point during the day. But you don't know when that's going to happen. Um, so you have a very um, kind of robust network because it means if you lose internet connection, everything still works, more or less. 
but it means it's very difficult to do many things that you, you want to do. And because of that, the data is not reliable often. Often these networks are designed for resilience and robustness, not for 100% response time. So a simple example of an implication of that, there's loads of these, but this is the sort of really just to give you a little taster, um, is you, you turn on the light or you press the light on in the app, you send a message to the gateway, to the light, and maybe it goes from that light to that light, um, and then the message comes back. But this is not happening in real time. It might, happen, it might take seconds, because that's, they've optimized the network for low power usage, not for speed, so, um, or at least speed of response. So what happens is you can press this button. The light actually goes on, but then it takes two seconds during which you don't know actually what's happening. You don't know, is the light on or is it not? And then you get the message back. So one option is you could just block everything, but this is not very good because the light actually might be on and you see a message saying sending, but the light is on. Makes no sense, right? Um, another option will be where you show something in line. So you can still continue to use the app. Okay, that's a bit better. Um, but you still have this bit where it's like in this middle state and you're like, what's going on? And your eyes see it's on. Um, the third approach is where you sort of assume everything worked and then you fix it later if it's wrong. <laughs> so. It really depends a little bit. And the, the, the thing is, this is often the right approach, but it's not always the right approach. And it might change depending on, um, like if you're controlling the light in your home, that you might want a different answer than if you're controlling your light from, your, from outside the home. So in the scenario you mentioned where you're turning the light on for your dog and you're actually from your, in your office, that changes the answer you might come up with um, in that situation. So, there's a lot of these types of problems um, that are, there's not that many patterns that you can follow. Um, it's just still, everyone's still learning this stuff. Which, which brings me on to the kind of, this point is that we don't really have the tools to think about these things very much. We don't, um, we're still trying to figure the, all of this stuff out. Um, there's this diagram probably many of you have seen, it's from I think Don Norman's book about the layers of, inter layers of interaction design or layers of design. So on the top you have like sort of very surface level things like the things that people f um, interact with. So like visual design, UI or industrial design. Then you have interaction design, conceptual design, service design, productization and platform design. So most of those are familiar-ish. So we have, I don't 100% know what conceptual design and productization is, I sort of know. but. When I think of UI design, I know the rules of UI design, sort more or less. Industrial design has ergonomics. Interaction design has its theories and practices. Service design has its as well. You know, we have customer journey maps, service blueprints, all of that stuff. And then I get to platform design, and I'm like, what the hell is that? Um, but that's what I did on this project. And I know what I did, but I also know that I don't have tools for that. I don't have methods. Um, I, I would, some of the counterparts I had were like technical architects and they had methods, they had diagramming methods, they had like, you can get certified to be a technical architect, you can do masters in it, I think. But there's a lot of training and I was like, there's nothing like that really on a sort of design or product side. So we were all kind of making it up as we w went along. Um, so I think that we don't really have tools at this level, um, which makes it very hard to have conversations about things. It's very hard to get feedback from things. So really often we had conference calls where it would take us like two hours on the conference call before everybody on the call actually understood the problem because it's just, it was just a really horrible, difficult problem that was hard to get your head around. Um, and we, yeah, there's just really no methods there. So I think this is a really big one is that this is something that's actually going to need to evolve. So the last point then um, is what will it take to become mainstream? Um, and so I think the main thing is that we need to consider the total value proposition. So me and my colleagues, we were trying to sum this up and we were like, you know, over the, the months working on this project, we were like, what, how, do, how do we sort of like, what's the overarching kind of way to explain this to other people? And we created a, a, an equation to explain it. And this is our equation. So if happiness is greater than money plus frustration, people will probably buy it. Um, 
The problem is that it often doesn't add up. So let's just go back to some of our things. The light bulb, pretty happy. It's pretty, a little bit of money, it's pretty cheap, and very low frustration. Light bulbs work. They might not have worked that well 100 years ago, but these days they're pretty reliable. They don't need, even the new LED ones like have a really, really long life, 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 lifetime, so you're not gonna replace it every year like older light bulbs. Then if we look at something like the clapper, it's, it's a little bit happier in theory because you have a bit more value. It's a little bit more expensive, but the frustration is really, really, really high. So it's not a successful project, a product. Unless, like I mentioned, some of the reviews on Amazon actually ha uh, were successful because I think this was still true, but the happiness was much higher because it was maybe someone yeah, who really, really valued the remote control aspect of it. And smart home is kind of often like this. The value is only a little bit higher. There's just not this true value. It costs quite a bit and there's a lot of frustration. That's, that's kind of the problem in many cases. So like I mentioned earlier, the smart lock from Airbnb, or not from Airbnb, that people Airbnb hosts use, it changes that equation because the value is really, really high. Um, it's worth all that, that hassle. And so what we try to do on our, on our project, and I think what's gonna take um, to become mainstream is, we try to increase the happiness by humanizing many of the features, by making them more obvious and make them easier to use. Um, IKEA is a master of bringing down price because they are incredibly good negotiators and negotiating with suppliers. So that was doing that. And then also like bringing down the, um, bringing down the pain of it, which is very high. Like I mentioned, not having logins, making it something that's more for the whole household. And so we try to balance this equation. And so to sum up, I think for smart home to be successful, we need to find the value and maximize it. We need to focus on taking the pain out of the product. Um, and then lastly, as a, as a sort of a practice in an indus industry, we, need to, um, we, need, we ourselves need better tools to help us design these complex systems better. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Question time. Hi. Hello. Sorry, I'm a UX researcher. I always have questions. <laughs> um, so what I'm interested in is, is scalability of these products. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say you have a person who has a few lights at home. And then ideally, you don't have the interface. You're just using it every, with everything with this click on this button that you were showing. Um, but then what if you have, I don't know, Five lights, you have a washing machine connected to it. I don't want to use the voice control for it to, in the end, um, washing my wool sweater with, and like gets mixed up and wash it is on 60 degrees. It will become pretty messed up. Um, so if you take, for example, washing machine, dishwasher, I don't know, you have all of these things. How do you solve these problems without having the app? Or like, how do you scale it? How do you show it in the interface? How did you did you ever like I don't know consider these kind of types of pro problems and how does it work? How would it work? It's really hard. This the answer is no. it's really really hard. <laughs> um, how it requires an extremely lar uh, har extreme amount of discipline um, on the product team side. So we we had these discussions with IKEA where we were like, what happens if we add blinds? And we were like, oh, well, blinds are kind of okay because they're sort of like a light, you know, they go up and they go down. And we were like, okay, so for that bit, we could put it in the app. It will, it will kind of, even the remote control up and down, kind of okay. It's a similar metaphor. And then they were asking, yeah, but maybe we launch other products. And we were like, okay, well, let's, let's kind of talk about that on a product by product basis. Um, I think the answer is there's times where you'll need to maybe split things out into separate apps. Um, you know, you might need to actually have a suite of apps in some situations, or very segmented app, like where you go into different worlds. Like, I don't think you need to be able to, I think it, you also have to look at the behavior. You're a UX researcher, you said, right? Um, you have to look at the behavior, follow the behavior, because something that you need to do like 10 times a day, or 100 times a day, like with lights, is very different than a washing machine. So how often do people put on their washing machine? It depends on your family situation, but, at most once a day, typically, I would say, maybe once a week, depending if you live on your own, maybe. So 
that changes things. And, and then how often would you want to control your washing machine from something that's not the washing machine? You know, maybe then, maybe that you only do once a week because you set it up to come on at 6.30 in the morning so that you wake up and your washing is done, you take it out. So I would want to try to find those scenarios and then I would take the answer from that. Um, I don't know the use cases for a washing machine, um, but I would kind of go, I would guess, my hunch would be that it's not that often that you have to do that. Therefore, it's fine in the app. And maybe voice is not the best one, like, yeah, hey, washing machine, can you turn on at 6.30? No, it's probably not, right? Um, but an app is probably fine in that situation because it's like, okay, I don't, like, the lights is different, you know, than the washing machine. A washing machine, you already have to go. There's quite a lot of things you're already, like, you know, my list of things there where I said, like, it, that, that's totally different for a washing machine. And that could probably, I think it maybe is okay if it's in an app, you know, because you're getting added value in that moment. That Super is hard. Yeah. <laughs> Are you working on a connected washing machine? <laughs> no, not, uh, not that, but uh, many devices uh, ah. many things. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but buy the book from Claire Rowland. That is an ex <coughs> excellent book. It's really, really good. Um, hi, I have actually three questions. Three. Can I drop it? Well, let's, let's, <laughs> shall we start with one? And okay, the first question will be, um, you said you have to find the value, mm -hmm. and do you approach with the stakeholder side or the user side? How do you approach to find the value first? Well, both, I suppose, it depends. Value can come from different places, like you can see from you know, doing research, you can see where value lies. Um, you can see what's valuable to people. I think what's really quite useful and what we did a lot is if you do research with the the sort of early adopters or the, even the people who are kind of hackers and sometimes hacking together systems, you, you, you go there and you look at what value there is. So you can even do this like online with desk research. So one thing we discussed was having like a sunrise sunset light. Like so the light would come on with the sunrise and, and go down with the sunset. And I found a few bloggers and stuff who would hack that together. And I just like wrote a comment like, hey, I saw that you made this, do you still use it? And the guy was like, no, I don't, I don't use it anymore. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, that's maybe a little signal, maybe not a full decision, but um, it's a useful one. But you, it can also come from stakeholders because depending on your actual group of people that you're designing with, you might often have a quite an extended group of 10, 15, 20 people. That's a lot of knowledge within that group. It's not perfect, but there's still a lot of knowledge and ideas can come from there too. So I think it's both. But. Thank you. And the next one will be <laughs> when you have the app, mm. when you're building on or designing the app, and then you have the hard product, right? And if you have a problem already with the, the hard product, but you have to still build a good experience in the app, how would you approach this? Like if you already have a limitation in the production level that, for example, the onboarding is really complicated, it's hard to register the product, but mm -hmm. you need to have a seamless experience in the app. <laughs> well, the, the, the best thing is that you don't do that. <laughs> you catch that beforehand. Um, I think that's a really important thing. Um, I actually had some slides I deleted because it's too long on that, which is designing for manufacturing. Um, and w there's a stra it, depends, it depends really on who you are in the team and your role. And there's a lot of sort of more politics, not in a bad way, but just there's a lot of pieces moving there. You're working in a big team, so some decisions get made earlier and it's too late. The main thing I would say is um, hardware is often fixed for months and months and months, and it lasts for years and years and years. I mean, there's a reason it's called hardware, right? Um, um, so you should design extremely defensively with the hardware. Design it to be as flexible as possible so that you can change something with a software update. Um, I think that's the main thing and re yeah really just if you have an option between like A, B and C and even if you're like A seems like it could be the really really good answer but C is the one that gives you the most flexibility in the future it might be the best to go with C even though you sort of kind of have to take an educated guess there but I think I, my attitude after being burnt I got burnt on some very big issues like that like we put a we put a single button on the hardware um, and it goes on and off and it sends a message, it sends a message, toggle. So if it's on, go off. But we turned out for, a, if this light's off and this light's on and you press toggle, 
So we learned way too late that we should have had an on button and an off button that you press. So we had the same thing. So after that, I would say, yeah, make choices that give you the most flexibility. Um, Thank you. I have a last one. <laughs> um, so how, I mean, I haven't really heard about the automation part. It was more like before like re remote control level. And how do you see the automation part kicking like IFTTT in the product? Do you think it's too far in the future or is it in the plan? Uh, I don't know. I don't think I don't think I understand the question properly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank not you so not much. your question, like the the big question. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it really depends. The biggest problem is that like people come up with all these elaborate scenarios and sensor computers are really terrible at understanding context. Sensors are really terrible at under, understanding context. Context. So like you said earlier, you said the example. Someone comes home. I think it was you said it anyway. Someone comes home and the lights come on and you don't have to sort of, or the doors magically open. Like this is a wonderful scenario. It, there's value there, right? That's, is that that type of automation sort of what yeah, you're talking about? Yeah, you're like registering the routine and yeah. there's a machine learning that you repeat your, track your behavior and yeah. repeating in the right time. Yeah, so the problem is, is that computers are terrible at that. They're, like, they're, they're really incredibly stupid and sensors are even worse. So um, let's say, like I, I, so I, I had a, light, a Philips Hue light set up when I was working on this project and I turned it, I configured it to turn on when I came home. And so what would happen was, it, it does it with Wi-Fi, I think, it detects that my phone is near the light. So I came home, I opened my door, and the light was on. And th this was not a magical experience. My brain said, why did you leave the lights on? <laughs> and so... So the scenario is actually that you open the door and the lights slowly come up. But in order to do that, you need to have an incredibly powerful sensor that might cost 100 euro. Um, you need, like most of these sensors detect changes. So if you have a sensor on the door, it detects did the door open or did it close? It does, doesn't detect, are you at home? And then you have other things, weird, there's so, so many weird things like this. Like I have a phone and I have it set that when I leave the house, the lights goes off. But what if I have a kid and the kid's still there? You know what I mean? Like these, the, the problem is the promise is really high, but it's incredibly difficult to do this. So if you, if you spent like, you know, 10,000 euro on a smart ho home solution that had all really good sensors, or maybe 50,000, you can do these scenarios. But almost all the solutions in the market, uh, people want to pay like five euro for a sensor, and that just isn't that smart. Thank you. That's what I'm also okay. having <laughs> in my head. So <laughs> good to hear it. Thank you very much for the answers. Yep. Anyone else got three questions? <laughs> We've got one. It's one, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I got one question. Um, but first, I want to send a message from a friend who recently bought the light bulb. <laughs> She's very happy with it. Um, so I want to dwell on what you showed with this um, in-between state, which is very complicated. And I mean, with these complex products, we have what, um, yeah, more and more comes, in, uh, comes a problem that um, it's really hard for consumers to understand the working principle. Yeah. So uh, I was interested on your learnings about how people conceptualize how this works, actually. Ooh, yeah. There's a metaphor, something that, analogy that helps them. Yeah, ooh, that, that is a, that's a very good question. <laughs> Man, I, I don't, I don't have an answer to your question for sure. No, I just Definitely not. But I, there were some weird things that happened with during user testing that were fascinating around that. Like one thing was, um, so we we gave someone a a kit with just the remote control and the light, and in a box. And it, we mocked up an IKEA box. It was pretty pretty fun actually. And we brought them into the office where we had a sort of an apartment set up. And we gave them the box and they set it up. And so they screwed in the light bulb and they were like, yeah, that's cool. And then we gave them another light and said, can you screw it into this, this, this light? So they went in and they went, do, 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 great. And then they went, why is it only working on this one? Because ex their mental model was a little bit more like a remote control and a TV. They expected it to work, but actually you needed to pair it and do things like that. Um, and so that was like a sort of an example where the mental model was completely different. And we were like, okay, we need to put a little flyer or something in um, to specifically say, you need to pair it because we needed to educate people on the mental model. Um, and then there was a lot of people who were like pointing at things. They were like, and they really wanted that, and, but we couldn't do that because it's not infrared, it's Bluetooth or something like this. So uh, yeah, I think this is a really, really big problem. 
um, I don't think anyone's really figured out the answer. I guess eventually just certain technologies will settle that happen to have a, a better, resonate better with people, but yeah. <laughs> um, so you solved it by... Um, we didn't yeah. solve it. Keep, oh, you didn't solve it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I mean, eventually it will be solved in a way, but yeah, yeah. onboarding is probably... We, we managed it, I would say, at best. Yeah. And okay. I think that's the whole of smart home is like it's about managing problems, not solving them yet. Uh, but you see, like, there's people who are, I think a lot of the really, like, really good kind of engineers are tackling these types of problems. Like, R1 was based on Zigbee, which is a mesh network, which was designed for, like, army usage, stuff like this. And then there's, like, a new technology sort of kind of supported by Google called Z-Wave. And there's a whole bunch of other protocols being developed. So what you see a lot is that people got so far, then the engineers realized fundamentally this protocol is not designed for what it is being used for. And then they tend to come up with new protocols that kind of balance the needs in a different way. So I think a lot of these things, it will only be when new, pro new protocols are created by engineers that we'll even be able to build the products. Um, what you really need is like a sort of kind of engineers who are very, have a good sense of what types of things enable a good user experience and they put a good foundation. But I think some things it will just be only when someone creates a protocol and the right combination of chips and everything that you can even build. There's only so much a designer can do, honestly. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Maybe we can get one last question. Okay, two, 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 two. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, I was wondering what your uh, take is on open source solutions such as OpenHub or uh, Home Assistant and uh, how much interaction there was with those communities during designing for IKEA. Um, I don't know that much about that at all, to be honest. Um, but maybe not to answer your question directly, but sort of a, when, when we were developing the product, especially with the version one, the entire product team was so incredibly focused on just launching a version one of the product, no one really had any headspace for anything else. Um, there was a lot of discussions like, is this an open solution? Is it semi-open? Is it like, uh, is it, you know, because you can be various degrees of open. You can say, we're like, it's running Zigbee, which is kind of an open-ish protocol at, at certain levels. Um, so you can actually, you know, it's somewhat interoperable with other Zigbee things. And then with sort of open source things, it was, it was like, it was often the answer was like, especially for version one, um, IKEA was like, we don't really want to open it because suddenly, like if we publish our library, then we need to support that library and we haven't even figured out how to support the product. So there was also a lot of times this talk about how can we do this in a step way? Like, yes, it, we should be as open as possible by the end. That was generally their goal. Like IKEA is not a closed, you know, they like IKEA hackers, they support this type of thing. So um, that's, that's furniture hacking, right? You know, um, so they were very open to that stuff, but they were also like, we don't even have the headspace to it. So they were kind of, yeah, like I say, thinking about step one would be, it's not too close to protocol, so someone can hack it and make their own library. Then maybe the next time is maybe having a developer support. Um, but then you need like, you know, five people to manage that forum and maintain and maybe like 10 people if you want to maintain like some kind of library and documentation. So they were generally like generally favorable to it, but it was always like, when do we have the resources for this? Um, and IKEA is an incredibly untech savvy company or not untech savvy. That's not right. But IKEA is a furniture company and it's slowly becoming a furniture and tech company. But that's a long journey to come on. And so they needed to build those skills up internally. Um, so even like talking about some of these ideas like forums, it was like, wow, you know, because not just because it's, it's, it's just, a, where does it live on the IKEA website? There's no forum on the IKEA website. Does it live in a subdomain? IKEA is in like, I don't know, a hundred countries, which languages do you support? Like, it's a very complicated question for them. Like things that would, if you were like LifeX, for example, for a long time, they were just, just, just in English and just US only. And when you're just in English and US only, a lot of things are easier. When you're in so many countries like IKEA, um, you have to be really cautious because you make one decision and it's like, oh yeah, that's like, I don't know, 50 million euro a year to like support that decision. All right, thanks. Just really last question. Uh, so was it conscious decision to not do IoT anymore and move to something else? Like, you know, the place where you're working on right now? Or like, and 
we're gonna make you go back to IoT. Does it make sense? Like, just, just do like yeah, yeah. last personal yeah, kind yeah, of question. Yeah, you know, nice like, is on. it like <laughs> we're not gonna do this? No, or is it like? Um, um, this is a very long career question. Um, <laughs> there's many answers. Um, it was it wasn't a conscious decision at all. I would have been very open to doing something else like that. Um, I would say, practically speaking, though. Um, if you go, if you want to go super deep into the IoT space, you're very limited in job opportunities in comparison if you just stay in pure software. Also, I'm from Ireland, and I, if if I look in Ireland, there's almost no IoT jobs. Like there is maybe on the industrial scale, but the, the sort of the actual I'm like sort of a UX product designer, I guess. Um, it's way more in software. So if I want to move back to Ireland, it's also helpful. If I'm in a little bit more of an open space, I'll be more employable. So. But it wasn't a specific choice. Um, I think it's a lot of fun. Um, I would recommend it for you all if you want it. It's hard as hell, though. Thanks, Kevin. Big round of applause for Kevin. <laughs> <laughs>